All right. Now, I wanted to do something before we dive into the Word of God, and that is to spend a little bit of time in prayer. I wanted to pray for one specific issue, two groups, and it has to do with feeling loved, all right? That I realize that some of us here, at the, here in the family of Bridgeway don't have loving environments that you live in all the time. Now, I grew up in a very loving home, okay? Now, so much so, my dad would say it all the time, my mom would say it all the time, and I carry that forward into our house. If you're ever in our Han household uh, with my daughters and my wife, we're always saying, I love you, uh, constantly. And growing up, this is how bad it was. I would pick up the phone and I would talk with AT&T, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Okay, love you, bye bye. But they're like, "Did you just say I love you?" Like what? Like I, I, you go into autopilot, right? And you just, I just said I love you to AT and T. That I'm so, that's so weird. Okay, so it just is second nature uh, in in my family. Now, not all of you have that, and so when you come into a church like Bridgeway, where we are high growth focus, right? We're high challenge. We are kind of like, if you want to grow in the Lord, man, this is a great place to be. Um, what that means is we walk into some very difficult passages that sound like, man, God's always like trying to get me to change something. For a lot of us, it's why we're here. But there's some of us that walk in with an empty tank. You understand what I'm talking about? And when your tank is low and you do not feel very loved or connected to God and all of a sudden you start getting challenged, it rubs you a little bit wrong. You understand what I'm talking about? And so part of the beauty of being in church is the idea that we not only worship together, we not only get to study the word together, but sometimes we get to pray together in a significant way. So here's what I'm gonna ask of you. I'm going to lead us in prayer here in a moment and have you raise your hands to the Lord if it's you. But anyone that you are not currently struggling in this area, right, of feeling loved either by God or other people, I need you to be an intercessor, all right? I need you to pray for the ones that are slipping up their hands around you. Now, once again, this isn't the, I gotta open my eyes and stare, right? This is, if you notice somebody around you does lift up their hand, I want you to intercede. If you don't have a sense that anybody around you, just start praying for them. Because what I would love to do is see people come in empty and leave full. I would love to see transformed lives, encouragement, strengthening, yeah? Because that's kind of what we need to make it through the week. Let's get a little bit recharged, all right? So I'm gonna lead us in some prayer. Let's go ahead and, and get started. Heavenly Father, that we are here, and some of us, Lord, have not been loved on all week, and this is our moment. God, those of us right now um, that are struggling with not having a lot of life-giving, loving people to say it or convey it in a way that we feel it, God, we lift our hands to you right now. If you are struggling right now that you don't feel like there's a lot of people that can say I love you and they, they really pour out love on you, raise your hand real quick. Raise your hand. Who else? Who else? Yep, okay. You can put it down. Heavenly Father, we're raising our hands to you because God, to be honest, our world feels like we're always having to generate love. We're the ones loving on everybody else, but it doesn't feel like we get a whole lot back. We are asking right now, Holy Spirit, that you would work upstream to be able to allow us to have a support network that actually can convey love to us. Lord, it's almost impossible, as you know, you designed us this way, it's almost impossible to go through life with any sense of joy if we feel alone, left out, and dry. So God, we're asking that somehow, some way, you would give us divine appointments, that Lord, that we would begin to have more love in our lives. God, there are also some of us that are struggling right now to feel loved by you. It's not that we don't know it intellectually. It's not that you haven't conveyed it in your word. God, I don't know if we're broken emotionally. I don't know if we're stunted or we've had too many defense mechanisms or we're just emotionally mellow. But right now, we lift up our hands to you because we're struggling feeling love from you. If you are struggling with that, can you just raise your hands up to the Lord? Feeling love from God, yeah? Yep, yeah, there's a bunch of us here, okay, let's pray. 
Holy Spirit, you saw us lift our hands up. We wouldn't have lifted it up if we weren't desperate. We know it. But Lord, when things get bad, we default to experience and relationship, and we need that experience and relationship with you right now. God, I pray that you would break through our emotional immaturity. I pray that you would break through whatever the enemy has tried to put a limit between us and you. I pray in the name of Jesus, a breakthrough, so that we would begin to feel the love of heaven come down. That God, by the time we are done with this service, there is just a, a beautiful tumbling of love in our heart, that, that God, when we lay our head on our pillow tonight, we know and feel that we are loved. When we wake up, we know and we feel that we are loved by you because you could not possibly do more action to demonstrate your love for us, but now this is personal. You said, God, that we needed to know you and you needed to know us. Lord, we are asking and begging for you to rip heaven apart and come down and be with us in our emotional space because, Lord, that's where we feel most soothed and drawn to you. Lord, you've, you've revealed to us that human beings are led by our loves. May we love you more than anything else on this planet, and would you show us how much you love us? God, would encouragement just flow even as we study challenging passages, even as we talk about real life and difficulty, God, would your encouragement continually give us the foundation of living a life for you? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, let's do it. Take out your Bibles. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians. We've been walking through a series. We are in part 15. The series is called Discovering the Kingdom. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 today, kind of going through half the chapter there. If you need a Bible, there's one under the seat in front of you. It's going to be page 957, 957. If you're brand new to the Bible, you drop it open in the middle, go to the right, super far, and you'll find 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. But you also got a handout sheet as you walked in the door. I'm going to draw your attention to the fill in the blank with just a couple thoughts. I want to begin by talking about pride. Uh, at the heart of all of our struggles in this world, usually pride will be found at the core. We all struggle with it, some of us more than others, some of us more overtly than others, but we all struggle with it. The reason you can know if pride's a problem with you is a couple things. When you're dealing with people Ask yourself this, are you easily offended by people? There might be a pride issue. When it comes to God, ask yourself this question. Do I give God any resistance to what he tells me to do? Because as long as you're resisting him, you're demonstrating that he is only one opinion. If he is truly your king and you are truly his servant, there is no debate. Does that make sense? He gets to issue out the command and you say, yes, sir, and you move on. If he is truly your Lord, and Lord means master, if he is truly your Lord, then why is there so much debate and resistance? If you're reading through the word of God and he says, do this or don't do that, is your response simply, absolutely, I'll find a way to make that happen? Then we know that pride isn't a problem. But if we're still pushing back and saying, well, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. If God says, hey, I don't really want you dating that person, you're like, well, it's up for the... The minute you push back, we know it's likely you're sitting in his chair. What is that? The throne of your life. As long as you're sitting in the chair, you're making all the calls. You're making all the decisions. You're like, well, pastor, I'm new to this thing. How in the world am I not supposed to make decisions? What, is somebody else supposed to make them? No, hold on. I'm telling you that all your decisions go through a channel. They have to be authorized by your heavenly father. So your checkbook gets run through him. Your calendar gets run through him. Your priority list gets run through him. Your daily agenda gets run through him. So ultimately, you may present ideas, but he gets to make the call. That's how you put him back in the proper position in your life. If you're wrestling with that, as I am, 
there's probably some pride issues involved. You see, because anytime something takes precedence over God, that in and of itself is an idol or a God to you because it's in his spot. The fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you is this. The way we live shows who's our God. The way we live shows who's our God. Is it you? And if you go, you know what, it's not me, Pastor. I don't have a lot of self-confidence. I don't have a lot of self-esteem. All right, then who is it? You're making decisions based on somebody's opinion. Is it your family? Is it your spouse? Who is it? Is it your friends? Who's driving the ship? Or is it God alone? That's where we need to get back to. All right, so let me recap where we've been in this series, right? So in the book of 1 Corinthians, we've been reading this mail exchange between a pastor and a very arrogant young church. They are so anointed. They have spiritual gifts flowing so strongly. They're getting miraculous words from the Lord all the time. When they pray, stuff happens. They have the ability to speak in tongues and connect with heaven, and things are just rolling. They got miracles breaking out. They have all kinds of stuff. And they're not only that, but they're kind of in a very intellectually intelligent environment. So they're bright, and they're sharp, and they're they really feel like they got it all going on. If you were gonna say that they were truly blessed, you would say absolutely they're blessed. The problem is all those kind gifts God gave to them led their heart to get more prideful. And they're getting more prideful and more prideful because they're thinking, man, God must really like me. I must be the most special one. And the more they felt that they were special, the more they thought they could do anything they wanted to do and there were no consequences. That's one of the dangers of pride. And one of the areas that Paul took him to task on was this issue about eating in pagan temples. And you're like, I'm sorry, I'm new to the, the story. What, what are we talking about? In ancient Corinth, in the first century with Paul, they would have temples all the way down the street to different gods and goddesses. Now, there's no such thing as any other gods or goddesses, but people believe that. And when they believe that, they would worship these fake gods but demons ultimately were taking advantage of it, right? The demons are like, hey, if you're gonna bow down to a stick, dude, I'll be in the stick, that's cool. Because then I get all your attention, I can start controlling your life. So in these pagan temples, there were meeting rooms. Sometimes they were for hardcore parties, sometimes they were just for social gatherings, sometimes they were for work parties, and the Christians, in Corinth, we're going to these gatherings in the pagan temple. And Paul's like, whoa, 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 hold up. We don't do that. And they're like, I have freedom in the Lord. Who are you to tell me and be all legalistic on me? I can go anywhere I want and do anything I want to do. I'm saved. I'm walking in a perpetual state of grace. You can't tell me what I can and can't do. Quite frankly, I'm questioning whether or not you should have authority over me at all. I believe I have freedom to do anything I want to do. That's where we pick up the story, all right? We're gonna dive into that. Here we go, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse one, page 957. We're just gonna kind of read little passages and then we'll talk about it. This first portion, I can guarantee you, if you are a Christian and been in the church for a long time, your mind is about to be blown because I bet you you haven't heard this before. This is one of the most brilliant passages of the Apostle Paul, I think, in the entire New Testament. I'm still learning, and this is a learning curve for me. You ready? Here we go. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For as Numbers 14, 16 says, they were overthrown in the wilderness. Let's pause. I can almost guarantee you that if you read this in your devotions, you would have blown right past it. 
<laughs> You'd have been like, I have no idea what the heck that guy just said, okay? Now, you are in the majority. This is, sounds very complicated. Once we break it apart, it might very well change your life. And here's what he just said. He said, all right, Corinthians, I'm going to make something practical, but I'm going to dive into the Old Testament to make my point. You, my friends, he said, believe that you are anointed, that you are highly gifted, that you are super special, and that gives you special allowance to do whatever you want. And they're like, yeah, what's your point? He's like, mm, I got a story for you. Who's more special than the Jewish people? Because he's talking to non-Jews, primarily. He said, let's talk about the Jews for a second. They are God's chosen people. God did stuff for them that he didn't do for anybody else. You want to talk about anointed? These people were lit up with the power of God. I mean, we're talking about Jericho walls falling down. We're talking about extraordinary manna miracles. We're talking about fire from the sky. Like, if you want to talk about anointed, you want to talk about blessed. You want to talk about powerful. The Jews saw stuff on this planet nobody else did. As a matter of fact, they saw things personally with the Lord people only dreamed of. And they still didn't make it. Let me re-rack you for a second. Let's talk about the Jews. Because they're pretty anointed, pretty blessed. Okay, now here's something that I want to kind of draw our attention to, and it's this. Whether you're on, and this will determine your age range, by the way, whether you're on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok, here's what I see in the background of all those TikToks. Everybody has a sign that says blessed, right? Doesn't matter if they're a Christian or not. Everybody's got blessed, everybody. Now, are all those people blessed? I'm going to guarantee you, yeah, they are. They're super blessed. Does that mean everything's okay? It does not. You can be blessed and still not be in alignment with God's will. Is that correct? Yep. All right, let's talk about that for a moment. We can be uber blessed, super anointed, incredibly gifted, shockingly talented, and still be out of alignment with God. Is that correct? Yes. yes. God's anointing doesn't equal authorization for our lifestyles or how we're living. The great oddity about anointing is it's God coming in with power and blessing you regardless of you. That's a very odd way to think about it. Just because we're blessed doesn't mean God's okay with what we're doing. See, a lot of times we'll look around and we'll say, well, I got miracles, or God answered my prayer, or this is going on, or wow, do I feel close to the Lord? And we think that automatically authorizes how we're living. That's incorrect. You see, it's a little messy when you have a really sweet God. It's a little messy when you have an overly kind God because he will actually give treats to his kiddos when they're not doing everything right. So you can't automatically go, well, you know what? That ministry seems to be growing and that's big. It must be good. Hold on. God has grown many ministries that were not healthy and not good. Because why? Because his kindness his kindness throws us off a little bit. All right, now let's get into the brilliant part. You ready? Here's what he said. He said, so Israel, you guys remember this, they, they walked through the sea. Anybody know that story? You guys know the parting of the Red Sea? That's kind of a famous one, yeah? We, we like that one. So here's kind of how it goes for those of you that didn't grow up with the Bible. So Israel had been for hundreds of years in slavery to Egypt. They didn't have any of their own identity other than being Hebrews. Then a guy shows up named Moses, does the whole let my people go thing, and they lead them out. Now, in getting them out, there is estimated to be about 600,000 of them. That's a lot of people. There were little kids, and they were able to bring flocks and herds. So they go out into the desert to go somewhere. Pharaoh changes his mind, chases them with his army. Now, if you're walking with little kids and they have chariots, it's not a fair race. So God ends up having them all come to a shoreline and they're like, oh no, God blew it. We're stuck. We're all going to die. God said, that is not correct. Moses, raise up your staff. Do you guys remember this? Boom, the water starts to part. 
even into a wall of water on either side. Now, how long does it take to get 600,000 people through the river? Quite a while. So how is God going to stop the enemy while they get through? He creates a cloud. Now, this same cloud, he would, it says he would guide them during the day by a cloud, a pillar of cloud, and by night, a pillar of fire. Do you guys remember this? That cloud was blocking the advancement of Egypt so that Israel could get through, then the cloud would dissipate, the Egyptians come in, and the water closed on them. You guys know that? All right, real quick, this is a science question for you. What are clouds made of? Okay, now, so what you have is they're walking through water, and the cloud is over them, which is water. So they went through the water. Does that make sense? They have it over them and on all sides. All right, hang on to that for a moment. He said then, when they got into the desert, they ended up having a couple different challenges. The first one was how do you get enough food to feed 600,000 people? As they went on, it became more, became about a million people. How do you feed them? Right off the bat, God gave them miraculous food. What's it called? Manna. In the morning, they would come out and there was little crumblies all over the ground. They would scoop those up and they were able to use them almost like flour and they would make their meals every morning. Miraculously heavenly bread, yes? That's called manna. And they were like, man, they walked out in the morning they're like, what the heck is this? And so they called it manna. You know what manna means? What the heck is this? <laughs> okay, very descriptive, I love it, yeah? Well then, as they're traveling around, they would need water sources, and they needed to be moving water sources, usually to feed that many people and have it clean. Well, they kept running into areas that didn't have water, so they would panic. They talked to Moses, Moses talks to God, and God says, I want you to go over to this rock, outcropping, and I want you to speak to the rock, and his spring explodes out of the rock outcropping and, and gives everybody miraculous liquid to drink. It's water, yeah? And you go, okay, pastor, so far I'm with you, nothing miraculous yet, okay? Nothing shocking. All right, let's put the pieces together. He said, Corinthians, you guys think you're really, really special and anointed. You are, so were they. You know what's interesting is you think that it has nothing to do with them and you, but do you realize they're our family? Do you realize that we are supposed to learn from them? Do you realize we've actually been in one long, continuous growth walk with God? Do you realize that? They're like, eh, kinda. I don't know, it's kind of ancient and now. He goes, okay, let's go back over the stories. You know what those stories are? Baptism and communion. They're like, what's that? Well, let's go over it again. Baptism, what do we do in baptism? We go down into the water, were they not going through the water and had water over them? Is that correct? And we rise up out of that. When we talk about communion, what are we eating? Allegedly, there is a communication between us and God that involves supernatural bread and supernatural liquid. Is that correct? He's like, all right, let's start tying all those pieces together. They had baptism. They had Communion, just like you. As a matter of fact, it's the exact same thing. And they were anointed, and you're anointed. But let's talk about what baptism ultimately means. Baptism, and I'm gonna give you a fancy definition. Baptism is a communal word picture that effectively displays identification. You're like, yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't, wasn't following you. All right, do it again. A communal word picture. When you get baptized, what are you doing? We have baptism classes this weekend. We're gonna have a baptism soon. Registration shuts tomorrow. Are you gonna get baptized? You're like, well, I don't even understand about it. Here we go. It's a communal word picture. What does it mean? There's a personal part and a community part. The personal part is that you are going down in the water looking like you're dying with Jesus, right? Going into the tomb, and then you raise up cleansed into a new life. Oh, that's resurrection with Jesus. There's a personal word picture you're engaging with and other people are observing it because let me ask you this. Do you get baptized by yourself? 
No, as a matter of fact, you probably, hopefully, bathe periodically. Is this correct? (laughs) Okay, when you're in the bathtub, are you not doing the same exact thing? You go under the water, you come up, but you don't think that's very special, right? But suddenly you're in church, do the exact same thing, and it has meaning. Someone lowers you down and brings you back up. You're like, oh, that's true, okay, that's cool. I mean, otherwise I'd drown. No, you're not gonna drown. You get out of the bathtub every time. (laughs) Why is that person lowering you down? Because they're saying you are so dead in your sins, you need someone to lower you in the grave and someone to get you back up. You're like, wow, that is powerful. Hold on, do you get baptized with an audience or by yourself? With an audience, why? Because there's a group part of it. Because the moment you get baptized, the rest of us realize you're identifying not only as a Christian, but one of us. It's an identification marker that you now have relationship with God and have relationship with us. You're part of our team. Is not communion the same thing? It is, and we're gonna use the same definition, a communal word picture that effectively displays identification. What are we doing? We're taking juice or wine, a liquid, and we're taking a bread. We're talking about the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ. We are now ingesting it. Now, a couple questions for you. You always drink liquid, and eat bread. What's so special about this one? You're like, oh, it's different. It's here in church. Now it has special meaning. We'll get to that in a moment. But here's the point. Is there something personal about communion? There is. You're remembering Jesus died for your sins specifically. His body, bread, hung on the cross. He died for us. He shed his blood, right, for the remission of our sins. And we're like, dang, yeah, that's super powerful. Okay, hold on. Do you take communion by yourself? You do not. You actually take it with other people because there's a group part of it, right? Now, we gotta go back a little ways before we all got cooties. Do you guys remember when we used to pass the plate, right? And everyone would take the little tasteless bread. Now we have these little super hard to open psycho containers right? And you're trying, oh, dang, you're forcing it out. And then you went, oh, I went too far, right? All that kind of stuff. And you're eating a wafer that surely is not real bread. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's some type of NASA created thing. Okay. This little wafer and you're taking it. Now that's not how it used to be. It used to be where everybody ate of one loaf and everybody would drink from the same cup. And you're like, ew, who's the last one to drink? There's like floaties and backwash. You're like, ew, that's so gross. Okay? Now, here's the, here's the funny way we try to address it. Along the way, the cootie thing freaked everybody out. So then churches started doing the rip and dip. Anybody remember the rip and dip? You rip the bread off and you dip it because that way the floaties you could just grab on the top and then you would eat the soaked bread. We just periodically adjust our version so it doesn't become gross anymore. Does that make sense? All right but you're doing it as a community. You know, sometimes we say the Bible tells us, before you take communion, I want you to examine yourselves. Do you guys know that? And we always like, okay, everyone, think about how sinful you are. I'm not sure that's actually what it means. In context, it means examine yourselves. Figure out your relationships, because here's the thing. You're about to go, thank you, Lord, for cleansing my sins, and you just hurt that person, that person, and that person. Why are you celebrating how you're all free when you're wounding all the people around you? You better make sure those relationships are good before you start celebrating that. Yeah? There's a community element and there's a personal element. Paul starts weaving these all together. Wait, because he's about to do something extraordinary with it. Let's keep going forward. Verse six. He said, now, talking about ancient Israel, yeah? making some points about they're the same as we are. All right, let's do this. Now, these things took place, written in the Old Testament, as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Verse seven. I'll give you four examples. Number one, number seven, verse seven. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written in Exodus 32. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
Example number two, verse eight. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, like in Numbers 25, when 23,000 died in a single day. Example three, verse nine. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Example four, verse 10. Nor grumble like in Numbers 14 and 16 as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages had come. What's his point? That's our family. They're the same quality as us. We got to learn from their mistakes. I believe in this world, there are two types of learners. There are those that can learn from other people's mistakes, and there are those that have to make every mistake themselves. I don't know which type you are, but it's usually based on personality. Praise the Lord, I am the first type. You know why? I'm a third child. Third children always look ahead and go, whoops, my brother got busted for that, ain't doing that. My sister went out that window and got busted, gotta go through another window, (laughs) right? See, the key is the easiest way to live is to learn from everybody else's mistake. Let them fall in a hole, and you don't need to fall in a hole. But there are some of you hard-headed people out there. You go, but what if I walk over the hole? Oh, look, you fell in a hole. That's weird. I don't even understand you. Why would you not just learn from someone else crashing and then go, I probably shouldn't go that way? No, some of you are like, I got to do it myself. Okay, cool. You do you. As a third child, my life is way easier. (laughs) Does that make sense? All right, let's move on. Now, he said, these are all examples from us to learn from. And he cited four examples. The first one is the story of the golden calf. You guys remember the golden calf? This is a super weird story. Israel comes out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. We're right back there. And they all park at a big mountain called Mount Sinai. God comes to them, and there's like thunder and lightning and fire. It is like scary mountain. It's like something out of Lord of the Rings, right? And then, of course, Moses had to put a ring into Mount Doom. No, that's not true. (laughs) He didn't do that. Moses says, I'm going to go up on the mountain, and I'm going to go talk with God. I'll be right back. He's gone for over a month. Now, everyone's like, our leader got fried, right? They're like, oh no, we need another one. So they turn to his brother and they're like, Aaron, you gotta do something. He's like, well, what do you want me to do? They're like, I don't know. But everybody's freaking out. They've been slaves for hundreds of years. They wanna have a raging party. These people are ready to explode. Our last God just killed our leader. Can we just get another one? We need a whole new movement, bro. This is the time to kind of rebrand, if I'm saying it right. All right, cool. Let's do something. And Aaron's like, oh, uh, okay, okay, let's make a cow. <laughs> Good answer, Aaron. The heck? They make a golden cow and then have a weird quasi orgy party. That, that's odd. Story just went to the right, yeah? (laughs) And only some of them were like, yeah, I don't know what's happening right now. God, up on the mountain, is talking to Moses. He's like, you might want to get back down there. (laughs) He's like, why, what's going on? He's like, "Uh, just trust me. (laughs) He goes down there, and he's like, what the heck is happening here? I go up for like a month, and you guys turn into a bunch of psychopaths. And he just lights up on them. He got these guys killing these guys, and it just goes crazy. Paul goes, yeah, don't do that. Oh, okay, thank you. Here's what's interesting about that scenario that plugs into our lives. Most of those people didn't make the idol, but they were celebrating along with it. They were giving credence to it. They were taking advantage of the benefits it brought. They could have all argued, well, I didn't make it. Yeah, but they were guilty. Why? Because they were enjoying the benefits. If you partake of the advantage of it, you are guilty of its creation. Just let that soak in for a moment. We all love the benefits of sin, but we'd never admit to creating it, right? If someone stole money and we happen to benefit from it, We're great because we didn't steal the money in the first place. Hmm. That's going to tie in. He tells the second story. Comes out of the book of Numbers. Israel had started connecting in with other Canaanite nations. 
those other Canaanite nations worshipped a god named Baal. Baal was worshipped through sexual immorality. They hooked up with these other people, and they started getting way out of control, so much so that Israel was torn apart by following God versus following this other God. They started doing sexual stuff in such a bad way that the nation's leaders were crying, literally crying, and crying out to God in a prayer meeting, and a couple went into a tent right next to their prayer meeting and started having sex in worship of another God. Well, one of their guys just lost it. His name was Phineas. He grabs a spear, goes through, and jams it through the couple and kills them. And Moses is like, okay, you guys, this is all getting way out of control. A plague hits, all kinds of stuff hit. Paul goes, yeah, don't do that. They're like, all right, I didn't think I was. Number three. In Numbers chapter 21, they all said, I'm sick of God being our leader. I'm sick of being in this desert. I'm sick of this food. I'm sick of being scared. I'm going to run out of water. I hate the way God is leading me. I want to do it myself. Let's get something else happening. And they grumbled and complained. And God said, really? And he brought in venomous snakes that came in and started biting everyone. They started killing people. And they cried out, God, what are we going to do? And he said, here's your solution. I want you to make a bronze version of that. Stick it on a pole really high in the middle of the camp. If anyone gets bit and they're going to die, look at the pole. You'll be healed. And they're like, that's stupid. And he said, well, pride was your problem, so humility is your solution. Number four. Two times. It's highlighted in Numbers 14 and 16. That they grumbled against Moses and said, we don't want you as our leader We will stone you to death and start over. And God says, you know what? I will kill all of you and start over. Moses is like, okay, don't do that. Paul said, yeah, don't do that. What was his whole point in all of this? Well, he's going to make it in just a moment. Here's his point, verse 12. He's saying, Corinthians, you need to be warned Just because you are flashy, just because you are blessed, just because you are anointed, just because you think you're a big deal doesn't mean that you're bigger than God. You never have been, you never will be. Your pride is getting you in trouble. You're about to fall, and I'm warning you. Now, God's not going to force you to fall. You just seem to be running in headlong on your own. So let me tell you some rules about how it works in this world. Verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. What does that mean? Once you think you can't fall, you're done. Yep. Been there, done that. Yeah, amen. Been there, done that. Okay, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. You see, God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with that temptation, he will provide the way of escape so you may be able to endure it. He said, guys, you're heading down a wrong road. Let me be very clear on where this road started. There's a difference between a trial and a temptation. They're the exact same word in scripture. How do you know which one it is? You have to know the motivation behind it because they feel the same. Let's say something goes in your life and it's terrible. You end up getting a horrific divorce and everything's tearing you apart and everything's going crazy. Is that from the enemy or is that from God? At first, you can't tell. Is it a trial or a temptation? You see, a trial is endurance training. It's resistance training. God does trials. He allows difficult things to come into your life so you have to push back against them and strengthen up. You are stronger when you come out the other side of a trial. Temptation is led by the enemy, still feels terrible, but all that pain is to tear you down, break you, and ruin you. How do you know which is which? God only does one, Satan does the other. Either way, you have to stay close to Jesus, is that correct? All right, but if it is indeed a temptation, you don't ever get to say, God made me. God will always give you an out, but you have to take the out. Does that make sense? All right, now... Here's his whole wrap-up point. You ready? This is where it all gets amazing. Verse 14. Therefore, my beloved Corinthians, flee from putting other things ahead of God, idolatry. I just want to speak to you as sensible people, he said. Judge for yourselves what I'm telling you. 
Here we go. The cup of blessing that we take in communion, that we bless with, is that not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we take in communion that we break, is that not a participation in the body of Christ? And because there's one bread, our whole community, we who are many, we're just one body, we all partake of one bread. Verse 18, consider the people of Israel and their sacrificial system. Are not the priests who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? All right, what am I saying? Verse 19, what do I imply then? What am I saying, that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I'm implying that what the pagans sacrifice is they offer to demons and not to God. And I don't want you being participants with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. As it says in Deuteronomy 32, 17, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? What, are we stronger than he is? Pause. This was his argument. Guys, all those Old Testament things, let's bring it all together. You thought I was being random? I wasn't being random at all. As you walk through those stories, we're talking about what? Baptism. We're talking about what? Communion. All right, let's get into that. What I'm talking about is rules of participation. You're like, uh, I, don't, I don't understand. I'm not following you. All right, here we go. It is not so much what you eat, but where you eat and why you eat. What have I been arguing since chapter eight? Don't go into the temples and be in a pagan environment doing pagan things. Why did I tell you? You're like, oh, I can do whatever I want. No, you can't, because it's ultimately not about you. It's about God. You keep thinking, well, I'm anointed, I'm free, I'm liberated, you know what? but it still reflects poorly on God, so we can't do that. So let me bring it around. When you have bread and wine at your home, is it magical or special? It's not, it's regular. But the minute you come in church, it changed the environment. The environment changed the experience. The experience changed the reason why you're doing it and why it has value. So regular bread and regular wine suddenly becomes this important connection with God. Is that true? They're like, yes, sir. Then why is that not the case when you go into a pagan temple and eat food? You keep saying, it's regular food, it's regular food. But look where you're at. It changed the environment. It changed the experience. And everything going on in that pagan temple changes the meaning, and so regular stuff suddenly is not okay. He's like, I don't know how much I need to argue with you more. Have I not sufficiently made my point? You see, when I tell you, I don't want you going in there, you're always arguing with me. Oh, I have the right, and it doesn't matter, it's not really demon meat, it's not really blah, blah. Stop. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm telling you right now, it's dishonoring to the Lord. I get it, you personally, you weren't attached to it, whatever. Your environment changed the meaning. Is that not interesting? I find that argument brilliant. And him walking through the communion with the old, right? All right. When we uh, do these series, I always try to leave you with something to go, man, I never even saw it that way. I never saw the world that way. I'm gonna give you one of those, but let me just recap what Paul said. You guys... You don't get to be all in with Jesus and be all in with the world. That's an irreconcilable marriage, right? We think we can kind of have one foot with Jesus and one foot in the world. And you go, but I know how to navigate it. And this is where Paul says, but it's not about you. You go, but I have freedom. I know, but it's not about you. Okay, so let's close out with something that blew my mind the other day, and I feel like it ties into this concept, and I think it's something for us to consider. If you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. 
Ready? Grace doesn't alter the sin, only the effect. Grace doesn't alter the sin, only the effect. What do I mean? We like to think that since we have grace and forgiveness because of what Jesus did on the cross, that sin doesn't matter anymore. Be careful with that. The sin matters just as much. It's just paid for and released. If you punch me in the face, I'm still hurt. Just because I release you didn't stop the pain. I just said, I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. Right? So what happens is, is because we think that everything is forgiven and we're walking in a state of grace, then it doesn't matter what we do. But it does. You see, the hit still comes. Jesus still takes all the pain. He takes all the betrayal, he takes all of that, but then doesn't nail you to the wall for it, but that doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Does that make sense? We think that because of Jesus, there's no more judgment on what we do, and you would only be half right. Because judgment has two different definitions. One definition says you pay a penalty. That part has been cleansed. The other definition of judgment means make a determination. I render judgment, right? That's still on. What do I mean? If you punch me in the face and I forgive you, I still know that you get violent when you get angry. So next time we hang out, I'm going to step back. Does that make sense? Because I realize you're not safe. When Jesus forgives our sins, he doesn't suddenly become ignorant. When he cleanses you, he realizes and marks down, I can't use you right now. You're not willing to walk with me. I'm obviously not that important to you. And we're like, oh, but it's all good, it's all good. Well, kinda. But he also is saying, you're just revealing where you're at. Now understand, I love you, kiddo. I've always loved you. I could never love you more than I love you when you're in the middle of sinning. My love doesn't change. But are you not revealing why I can't use you right now? Of course. The last thing that we tend to think that grace does that it doesn't is always take care of ramifications of what we did. Well, God forgave me, I'm good. Uh, Kinda. You see, if you hit me, I still have bruising. You can, I can say, I forgive you. You can say, sorry, and I still have bruising, right? Because a lot of times we will do something and we're like, yeah, but I'm good now. Jesus forgave me. And I go, yeah, but someone still has to put together the broken lamp that you threw in against the wall. But it's still a broken lamp. You actually have to go back and make amends and sort things out, Right? Just because you're forgiven doesn't mean what we did doesn't matter. It just means that your heavenly father is not going to let it all fall on your shoulders. He's going to take a lot of the hit himself. You see, as we finish, I want to say this. Sometimes when we read the Bible and we get all these different challenges and it feels like God's all up in our grill and we're like, gosh, you're always telling me something I got to change. Do you know why he does that? It's the same reason why you as a parent do it to your kids, right? They call it nagging. (laughs) Sounds irritating to them. Why do you do it? Do you do it because you're bored? Do you do it just to mess with their head? Or are you doing it because you truly believe that whatever behavior they're doing now is probably gonna get out of control? Are you doing it for their betterment? Are you doing it to keep them strong and healthy and thriving? Okay, that's why God does it. He's consistently whispering to you, hey, kiddo, I built you for more. I know you're content to be where you're at. I'm not. I need you to remember, kiddos, I built you to fly. I have so much more for you. And if you keep going down this road, you're never gonna experience all this that I gave you. And you know what? I'm not okay with that. So I'm gonna keep steering you. I'm gonna keep guiding you. 
I'm going to keep correcting you so I can get you over to a place of blessing where you're full of joy. You guys, it's God's love that keeps whispering in our ears and saying, "Mm, that might not be best. God's not mad at you. He actually loves you more than you realize. Amen? Amen? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for a wonderful walk through your word. God, the whole service, there's a a sense of your spirit being among us. God, I just pray for that unstopping of our ears. No longer blinding of our eyes where we can't feel how loving you really are. That God, that your love and our understanding of your love would just flow over us, in us, and through us. God, I pray that even though we have been challenged we walk out feeling more loved than ever before. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.